Here we are kids and we're doing uh, matter third class. We're going to talk about separating mixtures apart into pure substances. And also we're going to figure out a way if there's, there is a way to casually look at something and decide, was this a chemical reaction or was this not a chemical reaction? So here we go. A mixture is a physical blend of pure stuff and you can mix elements and elements together. If you took some, some zinc and some lead and put it into a beaker and stirred it up, that would be a mixture. And, and depends on how big those pieces are, it would be a, a nice little mixture or be a really, really heterogeneous, big chunks here and there. You could also mix elements and compounds. You could take uh, water, which is a compound, and uh, mercury, which is another liquid, or well, you can just take any elements in any compounds, literally sodium chloride and iron. You could take uh, methane gas and helium gas. An element and a compound can be mixed together, or you can mix compounds together, salt and water together, make salty water, but it's actually two different compounds that are mixed together. And the important thing about a mixture is there's not actually a chemical formula for a mixture, you can have H2O water plus NaCl. But if I made salt water and you made salt water, mine might be saltier than yours. Yours might be saltier than mine. Unless both solutions were completely saturated, meaning it would be holding the most possible amount of salt for that amount of water. Um, mixtures are just, there's no, there's no formula for salt water because there's no rule as to how much salt there has to be in the water to make it salt water. One little grain of salt in a lake technically is a salt water solution. But if you put three tablespoons of salt into a glass of water, it'd be a lot saltier. But there's no formula. Mixtures are just physical blends of stuff. 38, a compound is chemically bonded. Atoms are bonded together, like for methane, CH4. One carbon bonds to four hydrogens. Methane has certain properties. It burns, it's a gas at room temperature, very low density, completely different than the properties of what is carbon. Carbon is a black solid, non-metal, and hydrogen is a fairly reactive gas, invisible, lighter than air. Methane's not lighter than air. Um, it is invisible, uh, but it's not a black solid, so totally different properties. Mixtures though, 39, mixtures retain their properties. When you mix different things together, when you mix helium and methane gas together, some of that mixture is lighter than air and it floats to the top and methane is more at the bottom. And if you shake it up, you can mix them, but in this case, helium is gonna separate out from the methane because of the difference in density. But in the air in the room, there's oxygen and there's carbon dioxide coming out of my mouth and there's helium and probably some methane and all kinds, probably some neon in here, probably some water vapor. There's all kinds of gases in here. Each part of the air retains its own properties. And if you physically take them apart, the oxygen would be able to be breathed by animals, right? And the uh, methane would be able to be burned in a Bunsen burner. Each part retains its own properties. Now, since mixtures are just physical blends, you should be able to, and you can, separate them by physical means without doing chemistry on them. Chemistry meaning bonding and unbonding. For instance, this is a really easy one. Say you have a mixture of sand and water. You go to the beach with a bucket and you scrape some sand and some ocean water and you stir it up with your finger. You have sand and water mixed together in a bucket. It's a heterogeneous mixture. It's not the same throughout. There's more sand at the bottom. The sand is dense. It falls to the bottom. It doesn't really dissolve in the water. You don't need to do chemistry to take them apart because they're not chemically bonded. It's sand, which is a compound, silicon dioxide, and water, which is H2O. The way to separate them is you need to, in red, take advantage of a difference in physical properties. Now, there's a lot of physical properties you could filter them apart because one physical property difference between water and sand is that sand particles are pretty gigantic. 
compared to water particles. Water particles are made of molecules and molecules are invisibly small. They're incredibly small. Not as small as a hydrogen atom or a helium atom, but they're dang small and you can't filter water out of stuff. Water is so small it gets through any filter. But sand particles would get caught in filter paper. So you could take advantage literally with difference of size. Their physical, pro uh, their physical property of size. Sand would get stuck in a filter and water would filter right through. You could separate them based on a difference in physical property. Now there are other physical properties you could do also. If you're a patient, you could take your bucket of sand and water and put it on your back porch under the, under the umbrella and give it three weeks and the water would evaporate away. And then you'd be left with just the sand. You'd be able to separate the sands from the water. Now the water in a sense would get away. It would go into the air and, and in a sense disappear. If you, if you need your water, if you wanna separate this mixture, but you wanna keep that water, well, you can boil it. And you can boil it in a distillation apparatus where you boil the water into steam, but you catch it and then you let it go to a simple tube. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And you can catch the water on the side. You can let it recondense away from the sand. And then at that point, later on, you'd have some hot sand on one side because it can't vaporize at a low temperature, but the water in it could vaporize and the water would vaporize and then condense into a different beaker. The point here is, is in red. In order to separate a physically blended mixture, you need to take advantage of a difference in their physical properties. And there has to be a difference in physical properties. Some things that are mixed together have very similar properties and they're hard to separate by filtration. If you mixed, uh, if you mixed chocolate milk together, chocolate particles, the little, the little particles of sugar and chocolate are also so small, they go right through the filter paper as well. You can't separate sugar from water with a filter. There's other ways, you, but you can't filter them apart. So you need to take advantage of difference in properties that you can actually sort of manage. So if you need to separate ethanol and water, ethanol is the alcohol that's in wine and beer, right? You can't filter them apart because ethanol particles, the molecules and water molecules, ethanol is a little bigger, but they're still so small, you can't filter them. Now, if you boil them, if you happen to know, like I know, and I'm telling you, water boils at about 100 degrees centigrade, and ethanol boils at about 81 degrees. And I say about because when things are mixed together and not necessarily pure, if you don't have exactly pure water, tap water's got some salts in it, it's not going to boil at exactly 100. And ethanol, because the water is in there too, it's not going to boil at exactly 81. But they have a fairly separate boiling point. So if you heat up this solution of ethanol and water to say 81 degrees, the ethanol will boil. It boils at 81 degrees, but the water just gets hot. So if you, if you just had to get it out, if you had ethanol and water and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm thirsty and I can't drink that, you could heat it up to 81 centigrade for a few minutes and the ethanol would all boil away. And then you'd be left with hot water. Eh, it's a little too hot to drink, but you could cool it off. But all the ethanol would be boiled away. You could take advantage of a difference in boiling point. You want to draw this into your notes. A solution of ethanol and water just looks like water. You could taste the difference, but you can't see the difference. But if you know there's ethanol in there in water, and you know the different boiling points, you put a thermometer in the water, and you heat it up. Now, if you heat this solution up to 100 or more, then the ethanol and the water are gonna boil, you're not gonna get them apart. You would have to heat it up, but limit the temperature to say 81 or 82, so you, the ethanol will boil, but the water would not boil at that temperature. So you could separate this mixture apart, this solution apart, by taking advantage of a difference in physical properties. In this case, that physical property is called the boiling point. This is a simple setup for a distillation apparatus, which is, you have a nice big, a fancy glass bottle on the left that's got a big bottom and a tube. You put a cork, that black thing at the top is sort of a cork with a thermometer going through it. And then the tube makes sign of a turn. So if you heat up the water and ethanol on the left side underneath that, that container where it says controlled heat, and you heat it up only till it gets to 81 or 82 degrees, at that temperature, 
the ethanol will vaporize, it'll boil, and it'll go up, and it'll go up into that tube, and then I'll actually make a right-hand turn and go down what's called the condensing tube. Now, the condensing tube is just a piece of glass, but because it's not near the heat anymore, and the room temperature is probably going to be a lot colder than 81 degrees centigrade, which is pretty dang hot, way too hot for a person to hang out in. The, the steamed ethanol or the vaporized ethanol will then cool down enough to turn back into a liquid and it will drip. And I'm dripping it in red just to show you. It's not red, but it just shows you that the drips are coming out over there. And then only ethanol would collect in the, the beaker at the right. The water would be stuck on the left. It would be hot, but it wouldn't reach the boiling point. Now, when you distill things, especially if it's distilled from water, the truth is, and this is important because chemistry is, is, is very exact, but, but casually with things happening, we gotta make sure you know exactly what's going on. At any temperature, water can evaporate, even if it's cold, even in the winter, lakes have some evaporation. Evaporation is when parts of a liquid turn into a gas phase and it happens at any temperature. If you heat up this solution on the left of water and ethanol to 81 or 82 degrees centigrade, the ethanol will boil, but there will be some water that will evaporate. It won't boil. It doesn't have enough temperature for all of the water to boil into a gas, but some of it, more of it even than normal because hotter water evaporates quicker than cold. So once you condense this on the other side, once you vaporize the ethanol and condense it, the ethanol on the right side is probably gonna be about 99, maybe 98% distilled. It won't be pure because some water will evaporate at any temperature, including 81. So some water, not a lot, but some water will get to the right. And so often you'll see things are triple distilled. You would take this ethanol on the right that has a very little bit of water and you distill it again, and then maybe distill it again. And that hopefully would make it so that there'd be less and less water likely to evaporate. But distillation is a process where you take advantage of a difference in boiling points to separate two things that are mixed together. In this next example, sometimes you may have some yellow powder called sulfur. Sulfur is an element on the periodic table number 16. It's a non-metal, it's a yellow, feels like like talcum powder, if it's ground up. Sometimes it's more like a rock, a, a kind of a soft rock. You could scratch with your fingernail. It's a solid, but it's not terribly hard. But if you grind it up, it's kind of like dust or talcum powder, like a yellow powder, and it smells a little funny. And if you grind up some iron, you can get what are called iron filings, little tiny like dust, iron dust. And it's soft almost because it's really, really fine. If somebody were to mix up some of this powdery kind of iron in your powdery sulfur and mix it up, it would get, it'd be yellow and black specks. And you could do a couple of things. You could get a, a magnifying glass and a really good pair of tweezers and carefully separate out the yellow powder from the iron powder and take a long time, but you could do it. You could take advantage of a difference in color. You could see the difference. The iron is black and the sulfur is yellow. It would take a long time or you could take advantage of the fact that iron is attracted to magnets. Get yourself a good magnet, rub the magnet into this mix, and the iron will be stuck to the magnet, but the sulfur will not. So once you do this and you see all that iron that came off, put it on the other side, scrape the iron off the magnet, and then go put the clean magnet back in and do it again and again. Do it three or four times, and you will get the iron out of the sulfur. Because in this case, you're taking advantage of a difference in the physical property that iron is attracted to magnets and, and all the iron will attract to the magnet and none of the sulfur will be attracted to the magnet. And if you do this over now, in this case, the magnet's kind of full, there's iron all over it. And there's still, you can see some black specks in the, in the bowl there. Not all of the iron came out the first time. So once you clean that magnet off and put the iron in a separate container and go back to this with a clean magnet, you'll be able to pick up the rest of the iron. It may take three or four trips but you'll get all the iron out. You take advantage of a difference in physical property. In this next one, uh, this is a weird looking picture. Now, each of these markers appears to be black. A magic marker is actually a mixture. It's a mixture of colors. 
Now, just because a marker says it's black or blue or any color, what a marker is, a marker is usually got water, if it's watercolor, or maybe it's got some rubbing alcohol if it's a more permanent marker. And that's why they don't wash off your skin because they're not, you can't dissolve that stuff in water. It's, it doesn't come out in water. Um, but what you see is not really what is there, right? Sometimes the marker is black, but there's purples and greens and blues in small amounts, but the colors blur together on the page and what you see with one with your eye is actually a mixture of colors. So with paper chromatography, what you do here on each of these three strips of paper, you're gonna draw a line. We're gonna do this in class, so you'll, you'll get to see this in class anyway. We've always done it before, it's kind of fun. And then if you run water through this paper, the water will dissolve the colors that look black and dissolve the colors, pick them up, so to speak, and, and if the paper is hanging down, or if it's even on the table, it, it will carry them through the paper. And as it turns out, the heaviest, most dense particles of color drop off first. But as the water moves through the paper, it carries the lighter, less dense particles further. And then once it dries, you can see that there are some colors that are close to where you put the water in and some that move further away. And there's blues and greens and maybe like almost a teal on the right side for number six. There are different colors that when it's close together, all those colors close together will look black. But in this case, you can take advantage of some particles are aqueous, they'll dissolve in water, but some particles are more dense or less dense and go for a bigger ride on the paper with the water than others. And then when it dries, you can see those different particles more spread out. Some inks though are permanent. Permanent means they're not dissolvable in water. And if you wrote with a Sharpie and run water through it, it's not gonna pick it up and those particles will be st stuck in the paper. And that also is sort of paper chromatography. It shows you that those particles are not, they're not able to be dissolved or picked up by the water. They're stuck. And uh, not all black markers are black and not all red markers are only red. All markers tend to be mixtures of colors and you can separate out those colors, in this case, by a difference in solubility in water or a difference in density. They'll get pulled further or, or less far with the water because they'll drop sort of, they'll drop by gravity on back onto the paper. Pretty neat. You could also take advantage of differences um, with mixtures and freezing points. For instance, ethanol and water. Ethanol will not freeze till about I don't know, minus nine or minus 12 degrees centigrade. So if you have ethanol and water solution, you could evaporate or you could boil it and distill it, or you could freeze it. If you freeze it to say minus four, you'll get a big ice cube floating in liquid. The ice cube will be the H2O because that freezes at zero centigrade, but the liquid would be the ethanol, which wouldn't freeze till maybe minus eight or 12 or 14 degrees centigrade, minus. So you'll be able to take advantage of a difference in freezing point. Density, when you put oil and, and vinegar together, when you shake it up, they mix a little. If you pour them quick on your salad, you can get oil and vinegar out. But if you let it sit for five minutes, the oil floats to the top and the vinegar floats to the bottom, or sinks to the bottom. They don't mix for a couple of reasons, but they, they, they can separate based on density. Oil is a lower density. Oil floats on, on water or on vinegar. And, and the vinegar would sink because it's more dense than the oil. You could take advantage of differences in melting points. If for instance, you had ethanol and water frozen to minus 20 centigrade, it would just be a block of, of alcohol slash ice solid. But if you warmed it up higher than the melting point for the ethanol, but still colder than the freezing point for water, only the ethanol would melt. And you'd end up with a a liquid ethanol and a chunk of H2O ice solid that was still frozen. So any way you could take advantage of a difference in, in physical properties, you could separate mixtures relatively easy in a physical way, which is not chemical. All right, now we're gonna look at chemical reactions. That was all physical. Real quick, how do you look at a something that happens in chem lab and say, hey, was that a chemical reaction? Was that a physical change? Well, there's a, couple of things. Number one, a chemical reaction 
is when two or more substances combine and we get, what do we get? We get new pure substances that form and they have different properties than the reactants. Usually in a simple way, things bond together into something new, but also you could take something and unbond it back into its original component. So either way, we're gonna have bonding or unbonding, but no matter what, you're gonna end up with something that you didn't have before. You're either gonna form a new substance or you're gonna have a substance and take it apart into its elements. But the, the products will always be different. They'll have different properties and different formulas than the reactant set. You'll have the same mass because of the law of conservation of mass, but you're gonna have a different, different stuff with different properties. Now, topic B. Topic B is just an acronym. I made this up, it's not important. You could just memorize, what is it, six different things, but topic B will help you remember. When you see six different things in our class, probably a chemical reaction has occurred. The indicators that a chemical reaction probably occurred, but not proof. Sometimes there's some quirks, something will happen and like, oh yeah, change color, but it really was a physical change. But if you look at topic B, these six things that are gonna come up in a second, if you see them happen in the lab, that means pay attention because probably chemistry has just happened. Not a physical change, but chemistry has just happened. We're gonna go through these quick. T, T stands for temperature change. If you put stuff together in a beaker and it gets hotter or it gets colder, you measure that with the thermometer or sometimes you can, it's so great the change in temperature, you can feel it. Generally speaking, if I give you a glass of water or a glass of chocolate milk, not gonna change temperature all that much. I mean, if you give it three hours and the room is hot, it'll warm up a little. Or if it's a cup of hot cocoa and you don't drink it for two days, it'll get to be room temperature. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you put stuff together and something seems to happen and it gets really hot or really cold. Usually a temperature change indicates that a chemical reaction is happening. Physical changes don't really have temperature changes. Ice will melt into liquid or a gas may change into liquid water. Those are temperature changes also, but they're phase changes. I'm talking here, when you take two things that are the same temperature and you put them together and a fire starts, or you put them together and it gets really, really cold and, and water starts to freeze, that it makes no sense other than a chemical reaction probably is happening. Sometimes you put things together and you get a new smell. In Organic Chem Lab in college, one of my favorite experiments of all time, I took um, an alcohol, and there's a lot of kinds of alcohol, and an acid. And the alcohol doesn't really smell, but you can sort of smell it evaporating because it evaporates pretty quick. The acid didn't smell at all, but when I put it together to a chemical reaction, I made something called methyl hexanoate, which is why bananas smell like bananas. When you put things together, that don't smell, and all of a sudden you can smell bananas or roses or skunk or something, something bad. Not a skunk, skunks just spray out stuff. That's just, you can smell it now. But if you mix things together in lab and there's a change in smell, something nice goes to something bad or something nice goes to no smell or no smell goes to bad. If an odor change occurs, probably a chemical reaction is happening. P stands for precipitate. Sometimes when you mix two solutions together, you can mix two clear solutions or two color solutions or color and clear. Sometimes when you mix them together, a chemical reaction will occur as soon as they touch and maybe a green precipitate will fall out like particles or a brown precipitate or two solutions will go together and, and you'll see chunks, particles fall right out that weren't there before. Usually that means it's something from over here and something from over here bonded into a solid and falls into, a, into the bottom of the beaker. That's called a precipitate, when a solid for, falls out of a solution or falls out of two solutions that you've mixed because a chemical reaction happened. You mix them, but then chemistry happened. Now I is just, really it's just a letter I because I needed to make a word out of this, but chemical reactions tend not to be irreversible. When a chemical reaction occurs, all chemical reactions involve energy and usually energy is released and that energy gets away from you or you're gonna see some reactions where energy is absorbed and things get really, really cold and that energy is now stored in the chemical bonding. Once a chemical reaction happens, the energy either gets away or it is absorbed and converted into bonds and that, 
that energy is gone. It's no longer available. It's being used either in the bonds or it's heating up the room and spreading out through the universe. Chemical reactions, once they happen, they won't usually reverse themselves by themselves. You can reverse any chemical reaction that can happen, can be made to go reverse, but you may have to pay the electric bill. You may have to run electricity through something. You may have to turn the Bunsen burner on to force it to go back because the energy that was involved in the reaction is no longer available. It's either in the bonds or it's in the universe and kind of spreading away. The universe doesn't work backwards, right? You can push a rock up the hill and then you can roll it down the hill, but rocks don't roll back up hills. Same with the chemical reaction. Once they happen, they're done. Unless you, as a scientist, do some fancy work and put in energy in a certain way to make the reverse reaction happen, but they're not spontaneously reversible. C is a color change, right? If you paint your bedroom blue, that's not a color change, that's called painting. But when you mix two solutions that are clear and you get a green one, something must have happened. Something new must have formed it as a different color. Right? So color changes either from, from colorless to a color or from one color to a different color or even from, from purple to clear. If there's a color change, usually that indicates a chemistry reaction happened because something new is there with new properties and whatever was there is not there anymore because it's changed. The last one is B, bubbles of a new gas. Now I used to tease with my son who's older than you, he's a high school senior now, when I used to take him to Friendly's and buy him chocolate milk, he'd put the straw in and blow bubbles and bubbles would come out. These are not those kinds of bubbles. When you blow bubbles in something, you are just pushing gas through a liquid and there they are. But if you mix things together and they fizz, when you take a solid and put it into water and fizz happens, that's a new gas. That's a gas that wasn't in the water and that wasn't in the solid. Bubbles of a new gas, Will, will indicate that some new gas is being formed, some new substance that's a gas at this temperature is being formed, okay? New bubbles. When you pour seltzer into ice water or seltzer into ice to make it cold, you'll get a lot of bubbles that'll fizz out of it. Those bubbles are already there. They're already in the seltzer. They're not new bubbles, they're not a chemical reaction. Those are bubbles coming out of the seltzer that somebody put in for you so they could be fizzy for you. Here we're talking about bubbles of a new gas. Now topic B, these six things, indicate a chemical reaction probably has happened. It doesn't mean it had to happen. It means you gotta pay attention and think now, what's going on? These are the indicators that a chemical reaction probably has happened. And that, that's it. Put your thinking cap on for the next, next show, but this show is over. Thanks for playing. See ya.